My name is Taya Graham, and welcome to the Inequality Watch. As you know, the show is about the rapid and unfettered growth of income inequality, but we don't just report on it. We examine how this growing inequity affects, and in some cases corrupts, the democratic process and the policies it produces. But before I delve deeper in today's topic, I want to ask you to please take a moment to like, comment, and share. It really helps us get the word out and hopefully inspire people to take action. And I do read your comments and appreciate them. And you can always reach me directly at Taya's Baltimore on Facebook or Twitter. Now, as I just said, we cover and uncover the roots of an existential threat that an unprecedented concentration of wealth poses to humanity. And we expose the underlying political economy, which not only sustains it, but makes it worse. And to do so, we usually focus on something specific, an example that allows us to illustrate how the broader trends of inequity and economic isolation manifest themselves in the lives of people like us every day. If you will call on our last show, we attended the first meeting of the only prescription affordability board in the entire country. There we learned that this unique body, tasked with finding ways to lower drug prices, was being run by, now wait for it, a former drug lobbyist. When we confronted him about his previous ties, he didn't apologize or recuse himself from the process. Instead, he hailed it as a strength. Do you feel that, that ties to pharmaceutical, do you feel like you're tied to the pharmaceutical industry at all would be a problem for you? Or? No, I actually feel like it's an advantage because I've worked in all the sectors. It's the type of logic that defines our post-equity society, the kind of political rationalization that touches almost every facet of our lives because it often results in bad policy. It's worth noting that the so-called board is barred from examining widely used drugs like insulin or any commonly used medications. Instead, its sole purview is drugs with price tags of $30,000 a year and above. In other words, massively profitable drugs are off the table. Only obscene priced medications can be examined. Which brings me to today's topic, water. Like healthcare, water is essential. It's a right. You can't live without it. So given that fact, let me tell you a story about how one city distributed this essential resource and see if you can follow the logic and how its odd rationale touches upon the idea that inequity affects policy. You're the mayor of a city that is very poor and plagued by aging infrastructure. So stricken by both, in fact, you have to enter a federal consent decree to agree not to spend the money you bill for water on other projects. So to fund new pipes and reservoirs, you raise water rates 127% over eight years. Never mind that your city has the highest poverty rate in the state or that the majority of people shouldering the increase have watched their income stagnate over the same period. No, you don't do anything to alleviate that burden. In fact, you do the opposite. In a city that consistently loses population and is overwhelmed by abandoned houses, you have a policy that anyone who falls behind on their rising bills by just a mere $750, you place a lien on their home and put it up for auction. That's right, the logic is immaculate. A poor city with aging infrastructure, backs up water bills without any provisions for affordability, then kicks out homeowners who fall behind, thus increasing an already rising tide of blight and vacant homes. And that's not all of it. Just wait. It does get worse. Amid this crisis of affordability, a local news organization learns there is one group of homeowners who did not have to bear this heavy burden, that a select group of city residents were able to evade the rising rates and avoid all the nettlesome price hikes and drink water for free. Well, who was this lucky group? Was it poor grandmothers living on a fixed income or families struggling below the poverty line to eat and survive? No, it was the people that lived here in the Ritz-Carlton in our hometown of Baltimore City. I am not kidding. One of the wealthiest cadres of homeowners in the entire city hasn't paid a water bill for nearly a decade. In fact, thanks to investigative reporter Jane Miller, we know they had contacted the city and even asked for a bill, but the city never sent it. But it gets even worse. That's because last week we learned that even more wealthy business owners hadn't received bills either. The total they owe and who didn't pay is unclear. We asked the mayor's office for a list, but they sent us this response. They're conducting an audit, but couldn't even provide us a list. But the fact that even more people of means weren't paying water bills so outraged the city council that they called a council meeting to investigate. We asked the council president, Brandon Scott, how could a city justify taking people's homes while not billing the Ritz? Individual customers are getting billed outrageous fees, but then like Sparrows Point, which had a $5 million bill, was forgiven. 
Is the city being fair to like the average citizen? But also what I'll say, Stephen, that's unacceptable for anyone not to get a bill. Um, do we have an equity problem in water billing? Well, clearly, I think that we have an equity problem in Baltimore altogether. But that's not where this story ends. In fact, while all this may seem completely illogical, there's an underlying imperative that makes all these destructive policies work, a philosophy that we've cited numerous times on the show but seems to resurface no matter how hard we try to avoid it. Neoliberalism. That's because some of this seeming illogic comes from the tenets of the favorite theology of American neoliberals, that the market is always right. As we've recounted before on this show, neoliberalism is a political philosophy that became predominant when American liberals abandoned the idea that government programs should implement progressive ideals and turned over governance to free market privateers. It's a way of thinking that brought us massive income inequality, the Great Recession, lack of a living wage, and a profit-oriented criminal justice system, just to name a few. We also see in efforts to privatize communal resources like water, for example, or public education. But Stephen, there's some really intriguing ways neoliberalism has affected some of the aforementioned policies. Yeah. What have you seen? Well, our water billing system is a, is a perfect example of how neoliberalism market, rate, market philosophy has actually cost taxpayers money and cost ratepayers money and made it more difficult for poor people to pay and made Wall Street richer. Basically what happened was over a period of time the city uses bonds to finance water projects. But to but Wall Street has convinced the city to enter into sophisticated interest rate swaps, which they they say will save the city money. But in fact the exact opposite happened. Between 2005 and 2015 the city paid 90 million dollars to Wall Street for these interest rate swaps and paid about 40 million dollars in termination fees. So basically, the city lost its shirt to Wall Street, and then the city turned around shortly thereafter, and we covered this um, here at The Real News, and went after poor consumers and people saying that, yes. saying that $40 million in, in, in water bills rode and we got a collection from people at the same time that Wall Street was taking money out of city coffers. So it's a perfect example. But there's also another example that works in the water thing, and that is that these properties that go up for lean, right? So when the city says you owe 750 in a water bill, we're going to put your property up for lien. They put you, your entire right to your property up for auction at a lien. So as long as the person who buys the lien on an auction pays $750, they get the title to, they get the right to foreclose upon your house. So what happens is there's a cadre of lawyers in Baltimore City who make a business out of this, and they will buy up these liens and then go after poor homeowners in poor communities and hit them with all sorts of fees and hit them with all sorts of extra billing, like billing for copies and all sorts of stuff. Thousands of dollars that they have to pay or they foreclose on the house. So it's a win-win situation. Either you make an exponential profit, right? Or you get a house that might be worth $100,000 for a couple thousand dollars and, and some legal fees. So it's a perfect example. We're going to solve this problem of people not being able to pay their water bills by creating a market for liens. But the liens end up taking people's homes who are poor and ends up taking out the equity and the wealth of a community and putting the hands of a few lawyers who, by the way, along with Wall Street, donate small amounts of money to the politicians who allow this Lawyers. entire system to perpetuate itself. So it is a market-based solution that increases inequity and basically destroys the underlying system, right? Because the problem with cities, you point out, is all these vacant homes and people leaving their homes. Well, what happens when you evict homeowners who have built generational, generational wealth in their homes for a couple hundred dollars. So it's a perfect example. The water system is exemplar of how neoliberalism affects our economy, affects our way of thinking, affects the political economy, which this is really a perfect example of a political economy wreaking havoc on a community. You know, this really amazes me. Not only was I aware that homeowners were having their homes taken away from them, basically taking away any chance of a generational passing of wealth, but that our city actually went and gambled on Wall Street with ninety yes. million dollars and lost. Yes. Why aren't we yelling at City Hall every day about because it's this? Because it's very it's very difficult to explain. You know, an interest rate swap is a very sophisticated financial instrument. The city doesn't report it. The city doesn't put out a press release saying, "I just had to pay Wall Street thirteen million dollars in two thousand thirteen because I screwed up." Right. They don't tell you. All this happens in this very um, obscure board called the the finance board, which meets like once a month in the bowels of City Hall that no one knows anything about. So it's not something that's ever publicized, and it's not something that gets a lot of scrutiny because the mainstream media doesn't focus on that. They just, they buy the infrastructure argument. They say, we need more infrastructure, and God knows what's going on with that. But they never look at this because, you know, it, 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 it takes you from the tenets of capitalism and, and free market solutions. The market will solve everything. And I think that that philosophy is embraced by the mainstream media, and that's why we don't hear about it. You know, I can't imagine that Baltimore City is the only city or town no. that has had no, its, its politicians gamble on no. Wall Street and lose. This has been, there are examples of this all across the country of cities being, you know, 
cities being sort of lured into what sophisticated financial maneuvers end up costing money. I mean, the people from Wall Street don't, uh, you know, fly around on private jets because they're making just deals to help a community. <laughs> That's a good you know, they're scavengers. On this show, we like to cite literary figures whenever possible, and it's hard to resist not mentioning one of our favorites, F. Scott Fitzgerald. The legendary chronicler of the wealthy in the early part of the 20th century was famous for painting a stark picture of the rich during the last time wealth inequality was as extreme as it is now. Ironically, one of Fitzgerald's most popular works had a title relevant to today, A Diamond as Big as the Ritz not just by title, but narrative. The story tells the tale of a man who finds a diamond deposit so large it would make him the richest man on earth, save for one issue. The abundance of diamonds, if unleashed all at once, would make them all worthless. The conundrum prompted him to hoard his wealth. So perhaps the story provides an analogy for our own era of income inequality. As we've recounted on the show before, the rich are hoarding wealth at an unprecedented rate, and the consequences can be felt everywhere. The question is, will hoarding wealth by our own elite have the same result, making the wealthiest one day worthless and cause untold suffering along the way? It's hard not to make this argument when destructive wealth creating mechanisms like fossil fuels or for profit health care or a monetized criminal justice system continue to create a myriad of social ills. It's hard to ignore the parallels when, in the wealthiest country on earth, over half a million people go bankrupt each year due to medical bills. It's really hard to make the case this won't happen when people die because they can't afford insulin, that the top 10 drug makers racked up $26 billion in profits in one year alone. The point of the Ritz analogy is critical. How can this system be sustained? How can an ideology that produces such uneven and seemingly irrational results be sustained? Perhaps we have to go back even further to the Greek philosopher Plato. In his book, The Republic, Plato spends much of his time recounting the debate of Socrates over what is the best way to form a republic. And while the discussion covers a wide range of topics, the participants come to an agreement on one principle, a society to function well must be just. And perhaps that's a question we have to be asking. Instead of lauding the wealth of billionaires and basking in the glow of their excess, instead of spending public resources and time on a prescription board that can't look at essential drugs and is run by a former lobbyist, and instead of using water money to bolster Wall Street profits, maybe we should ensure that affordable and accessible health care is available to all. In summary, maybe we should be asking the same question Plato did. Is this just? I want to thank my colleague Stephen Janis for his investigative reporting and work on this piece, and I want to thank you for joining us. And if you have stories of wealth inequality or struggles with health care, please share them with us in the comments. And don't forget to like and share. Every time you do it, it really helps us keep the show going. Or message me directly at Taya's Baltimore Facebook or Twitter. My name is Taya Graham, and I'm your host for this Inequality Watch. Thank you for watching.